Well, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Farm Bill Program's One Stop Workshop. Uh, today's webinar is intended to provide an overview of the various USDA uh, agencies within the service, the service center, um, and then go a little bit deeper into the programs that they offer. So my name is August Taylor, my pronouns are they, them, and he, him, and I am here representing OFA, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. So first, I want to provide an overview of the agenda and what we're going to be doing today, and then we will we'll get right into it. So first, like I mentioned, we're going to have an overview of the four agencies within the USDA Service Center. So those are the Farm Service Agency, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the Risk Management Agency, and Rural Development. We'll then have a, a short uh, panel with a Q&A where we'll have some prepared questions, and then you also have an opportunity to ask questions um, a little bit more about those different uh, agencies. Then we will have different farmers present on the ways that they have utilized some of these programs to improve their operation. Um, and after they present, we'll go into breakout rooms and you'll, have a, you'll be able to choose um, a breakout room based on what uh, farmer or programs you wanna learn a little bit more about. And then we will come back together, debrief, and we will talk about some next steps. So first, I want to invite you to read the community standards that we have at the bottom of the slide. They're also posted in the chat, so I just want you to take one to two minutes to go ahead and read those. And when you're done, give me a good thumbs up that you agree to our standards. Thank you for the virtual thumbs up as well. Nice. All right, then I think we can get started. Terry, are you able to advance the slide? There we go. So like I mentioned, my name is August Taylor. Um, I work for Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association, or OFA. So OFA is a statewide and regional organization that seeks to cultivate a future where farmers thrive and local food nourishes our communities and agriculture enhances the environment. So what that really means is we are just one big farmer support organization. We like to say that we are a big tent uh, we don't necessarily have one specialization, but we like to help in a lot of different areas. Um, so namely, we have uh, kind of two organizations within one. We have OFA Organic Certification, where we provide uh, organic certification for a 12-state region. And then we also have an education department um, where we do, oh goodness, various work, uh, mostly in begin farming. We have a begin farming team that focuses on business, business and financial oh, development. Um, and also land access. We have a few sustainable agriculture educators where you can really call in regardless of whether or not you're certified with us uh, and get some guidance or connections on um, how, how to basically improve your farm. Uh, we also do a lot of policy work currently developing our platform for the 2023 Farm Bill um, and also developing a soil health campaign. We also offer various network and farmer resource opportunities. So really trying to connect farmers with the resources that will help them thrive. Uh, and finally, we do have a series of events, including farm tours over the summer and workshops, and most notably our annual conference, which is in February. So I'm going to pass it off to Molly, who's gonna give us some more info on rural action. Hey, everyone. Um, so my name is Molly Sowash. I uh, work at Rural Action as the Sustainable Agriculture Program Manager, um, and we're one of the partners on this webinar and have been um, excited to put this on. Uh, on this call also are my coworkers Katie Lloyd and Tom Redfern of Rural Action. So if you have further questions about what we're up to, feel free to chat any of us. Um, but we work primarily in the Appalachian counties of Ohio um, to build a more just economy and develop the region's assets. Um, so we work across 
asset, uh, sorry, across sectors. Uh, we're coming to you from the Sustainable Agriculture Program, um, but we also have forestry, environmental education, sustainable energy, uh, and so on. I think most relevant to the folks on this call is our whole farm project, which supports beginning and established farmers um, with kind of wraparound services. Um, so we hold an annual business planning and mentorship series to match beginning farmers with a more experienced producer and write a business plan and further their goals, um, as well as various topical on-farm and virtual workshops, one-on-one uh, -on -one site visits, forest or whole farm management plans, access to professional services like an accountant or a lawyer, loan support, and um, we're kind of branching into some silvo pasture support and on-farm solar or agrivoltaics. Um, so looking forward to maybe connecting with you all further. All right. Um, my name is Carrie Brown. I am the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Educator with um, Ohio State University Extension. Um, I'm based out of Fairfield County, and I am the um, third partner um, in this webinar, along with OFA and Rural Action. Um, Ohio State University Extension, ANR, um, provides folks with resources and educational programming that uh, focuses on, on uh, um, profitability and sustainability um, and uh, keeping Ohio's natural resources uh, clean, so being uh, good stewards of the earth. Uh, we focus in, in quite a few different areas including um, ag safety and health, um, row crops, livestock, uh, as well, and new and small farms, as well as uh, the horticulture side of things as well, and things like business management um, and marketing. Uh, there is an Ohio State University Extension office in uh, every uh, county within the state. Um, most counties have uh, agriculture and natural resource extension educators like myself. Uh, so if you are interested in getting in touch with your uh, county agent, then uh, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information will be at the end of the presentation today, and I can help make that connection with, with your county's extension educator. So from here, we're going to move into our USDA uh, um, agency overviews. We're going to start with Farm Service Agency. Then we'll move into NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, Risk Management Agency, and Rural Development. So each of these presentations will last about 10 minutes. And Kurt, go ahead and get us started with Farm Service Agency. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Uh, my name is Kurt Lever. I'm a district director with the Farm Service Agency. I also serve um, as the Beginning Farmer Rancher representative for the Farm Service Agency in Ohio, part of the uh, BFR team for Ohio with uh, three others. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the opportunities that we have within the Farm Service Agency. Uh, my role is to oversee uh, the implementation of farm programs and farm loan programs in Northwest Ohio. Um, however, we'll cover uh, programs that are available throughout the country. Uh, so if we could progress to the next slide, please. Okay, so to start off, FSA consists of two main service areas. Uh, one is the farm program area, uh, and, and that is uh, our program area that administers our commodity programs, our entitlement programs, our farm bill directed programs. Um, and you can see there's a, a litany of acronyms listed below there. If you participated with our programs, you understand we use a lot of acronyms. Um, but um, uh, those are all originated, um, well, they're funded through the Farm Bill, um, and uh, whether it's through targeted or discretionary funds. And, um, and then we also have the Farm Loan Programs, which are uh, programs that are statutory, they are written into law, and they are funded through the annual budget. Um, the loan programs uh, administer loans and guarantees uh, through through either directly through the agency or um, through uh, participation with a commercial lender to put money into the community uh, in the form of loans. 
And uh, that's where it's outlined there, direct or guaranteed loans. So direct loans are made directly through the agency and guaranteed are, uh, are backed by the agency through a commercial lender. Uh, so starting off with farm programs, the, the main goal of our farm programs is, uh, is to provide support to our rural America uh, through price support, conservation, and disaster assistance programs. And uh, lately, there's been an initiative to make sure that we're expanding these programs into the urban settings and, uh, and figuring out how we can, we can tailor um, our programs that are existing uh, and also possibly tailoring new programs uh, to meet the needs of our, of our urban and specialty farmers as well. Uh, the farm programs side, uh, or you might hear it referred to as the county office, uh, is the keeper of the majority of the USDA farm records. Uh, so if you hear about obtaining a farm number, this is the office that, that does that. Um, it's important to have a farm number. A lot of the programs that are administered uh, are based on that information uh, and acreage reporting that's associated uh, annually with that farm number. And uh, that's, that's really where we base our eligibility and, uh, and, and uh, really evaluate our eligibility for each program. Uh, so farm programs are, bait, are split up into three main areas. And the first one is price support programs. Uh, those are, are what we call ARC or PLC, our, which is our average revenue coverage or price loss coverage, the two options that were outlined through the last farm bill. Um, those are price, again, price support programs. We have also under that the farm storage facility loan program, which can offer um, solutions for storage of commodities, whether it be our, our traditional corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, hay storage, um, cold storage for produce can also use that program now for uh, certain uh, uh, trucks, equipment, transportation, uh, processing, things of that nature, um, depending on, on what your, your need is there. Uh, we have some dairy programs. We also do market assistance loans um, that are for mark help marketing and commodity. Uh, then we have a litany of ad hoc programs that have seemed to come out lately. Uh, as a result of either uh, the pandemic or uh, you know, trade issues that are going on, disruptions. So, um, and we just recently had another one that's been announced, it's called ERP. And uh, we're getting more details on that as, as we uh, actually speak here. So um, those programs tend to come out of discretionary funding and, uh, and they're authorized by Congress through um, uh, through uh, a, a seen need in the communities. So the second uh, area I'd focus on with farm programs is the conservation programs. And a lot of these are done in participation with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, which Doug will talk about here coming up. Um, but uh, CRP is a big one for us, uh, really focuses on conservation of the soil, um, uh, preventing runoff and things of that nature. Uh, there's also a bunch of other uh, benefits that can be obtained through participation in our different conservation programs. Uh, and then the final leg in farm programs is our disaster assistance programs. And um, right now, uh, the big one uh, under the farm bill is, is called NAP. It's the Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program. And it serves to fill the uh, the gap essentially beyond what the risk management agency authorizes to be covered uh, through traditional crop insurance. And that's a, a very popular program. Uh, it's, a, it's a very useful program for uh, farmers of, of all specialty crops or non-insurable crops. Um, again, we also have, uh, I won't go through them all, this is a, a small cross section of what is offered for disaster programs. Uh, some of it is uh, while they're all available throughout the United States, they're more pertinent in certain areas or more prevalent in certain areas uh, based on the type of agriculture that exists in those areas. Uh, and those are all available again through the county office. Uh, and again, like I'd mentioned, the second part of the FSA is the farm loan program administration. So farm loan programs, um, it serves the function uh, in one aspect of, of a bank. Uh, we make loans, 
we service loans, we collect on loans, uh, we help with business planning, um, and uh, we really work with folks who are in the production of an eligible commodity uh, and try to help them uh, meet the needs, uh, the credit needs of their operation. So within farm loan programs, we have two different types of loans, as I'd mentioned before, the direct loans, which are made and serviced by FSA as if FSA is actually the bank. Uh, the borrower applies directly to FSA for these loans. And we also have guaranteed loans, and those are made and serviced by a commercial lender, but FSA will back that loan. And essentially what that does is it, it allows the lender to mitigate some risk in making that loan, which number one, makes it uh, the lender more uh, willing to make the loan, uh, which puts more money into our agricultural communities. And number two, it, it, um, it, it takes a lot of the, uh, the risk off of their books uh, so that their regulators allow them to do this. Uh, so it, it puts their minds at ease and it also puts their bookkeepers at ease uh, when FSA is reviewing these loans and allowing, uh, allowing for the financial backing of these. So within each program area, direct or guaranteed, we have a subset uh, called farm ownership loans which are for long-term assets. We look at loan terms from 10 to 40 years, uh, falling underneath the farm ownership loans can be really for purchasing farmland as the name implies, or it can be for uh, larger construction projects or larger land improvement projects, uh, those sort of things. The other subset is called operating loans and we break that into term and annual operating loans. Annual operating loans being for the, just like it says, the annual uh, in, uh, expenses incurred through the operation, whether it's uh, seed, uh, feed, fertilizer, what have you. Um, and those are paid back typically within the operating cycle, which a lot of times is 12 months, but can be extended out to up to 18 months, depending on need. Uh, term operating loans are more for our equipment. Those are um, terms of two to seven years. Uh, we make minor real estate improvements uh, with, with our term operating loans, but uh, for all of our loans, we have to demonstrate uh, feasibility, which means the ability to repay the loan and also secure uh, collateral, um, uh, sufficient collateral to uh, secure the loan. Uh, a few spe uh, specific programs, or, or maybe not necessarily programs, uh, in, in each case, but um, arrangements maybe is a better term I wanted to highlight for this group. The first is the beginning farmer down payment program. And this program is eligible to, to anyone who uh, qualifies as a beginning farmer, uh, which is somebody who has farmed uh, experience for uh, three to 10 years. Uh, also eligible to anyone who qualifies as a socially disadvantaged applicant. And uh, just recently uh, being implemented, uh, anybody that qualifies as what's uh, called a veteran farmer. So uh, this program allows for our, um, our lenders uh, to work in conjunction with us to make a loan in a participation style. So we would provide up to 45% of the purchase price on real estate um, with a 5% down payment. Our portion would be uh, would be uh, financed at one and a half percent on a 20 year amortization. The other lender would come in and finance their portion at their rates on a 30 year amortization. It's been a very popular program for us. Um, it it allow if you've had any experience with trying to buy land, five percent cash down is is very very attractive. Um, most are 20 to 30 percent range uh, depending on on the acres you're purchasing. So. Uh, that is one great opportunity there. Another is uh, we call it joint financing arrangements. This can be farm ownership or operating loans. Uh, we can essentially split the per or split the uh, the financing 50-50, uh, up to 50-50 with a participating lender. Our portion is financed on a two and a half percent fixed in interest rate for a amortization uh, that is to be determined, a payment schedule to be determined. And um, we just ask that the participating lender is, is somewhat close to what we're doing there on terms. And then finally, we have the microloan program. And, and that is a really popular program for folks that maybe have minimal experience or have um, a smaller, smaller need financially. Um, it's, a, it's a great foot in the door program. It can be used for FO or OL purposes. 
um, it allows for a lot of flexibility in the eligibility requirements. We can, we can utilize partnerships with some of our incubator programs. Uh, we can utilize partnerships or participation in some of our other, uh, uh, other maybe non-conventional um, education programs. Uh, we can utilize a substitute uh, veteran experience in the services for some of these uh, years of experience. So that microloan program is a great opportunity as well to, uh, to get started. And so that wraps up my, uh, my quick uh, 30,000 foot view of what the Farm Service Agency offers. I'd like to direct you to farmers.gov. Uh, we have a, a, uh, a really wide variety of information there that uh, you can self-guide yourself through. Uh, you, there's an office locator on there where you can figure out uh, where the nearest FSA office is to your area. Um, and then my, uh, my email address is listed there. Please feel free to reach out to me uh, or any of my counterparts if you have any questions about FSA programs or anything that we've talked about today. So thanks again, everybody, for your time. And I will yield back to Carrie. All right, thank you, Kurt. So as we go through this, if you do think of questions, um, go ahead and, and put them in the chat. Uh, once we get done with the presentations, uh, we'll take a five minute break, but then we'll come back for a 20 minute panel. So you'll have an opportunity to, to ask, ask questions to all four of our representatives. Um, we're going to move on into NRCS. So go ahead, right, Doug. All right, thank you, Carrie. Uh, my name is Doug Deardorf. I am a resource conservationist and also a member of the USDA Beginning Farmer Team, along with my colleagues, and wanted to take a couple moments to share with you the conservation opportunities for new and beginning farmers. Uh, during the presentation, these are the stops we're going to make along the way, briefly discuss what NRCS is, its mission, uh, the folks that, uh, that work with us, the types of technical assistance and financial assistance that are available and how you can locate a county office. Uh, for the purposes of beginning farmer definition, NRCS uses uh, a definition that says that the, the, the applicant farmer or rancher is a person who has not um, operated a farm or a ranch or has done so for less than 10 years and is uh, involved in the everyday operations of that farm. Uh, first stop is what is NRCS? Uh, NRCS is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, it has its origins in the Dust Bowl when uh, wind erosion was causing a terrible mess in the mid part of the United States. Congress uh, created the Soil Conservation Service and that has changed to the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Our focus is still to provide technical assistance voluntarily uh, to put conservation on the ground. Our assistance, like all of our counterparts that will present today, is customer focused. NRCS's assistance comes in the form of technical and financial assistance. Technical assistance. Uh, NRCS has a, a long history of boots on the ground where we, we meet with that farmer or rancher on the ground, on their farm, to discuss the conservation objectives that that farmer or rancher has and offer suggestions on how to improve their operations and to protect their natural resources. NRCS has a, a wide variety of technical specialists that are available to, to provide assistance to landowners, uh, anywhere from planners to engineers, geologists. We also are able to, to leverage the assistance of our local soil and water district partners, along with the Division of Forestry, the Division of Wildlife, and even non-governmental groups like the Pheasants Forever. Uh, this type of assistance we feel brings a, a full package of specialists to, to help that farmer or rancher achieve their objectives. Okay, how do we get started? Well, the first step is, is pretty easy. You either call or contact your local NRCS office, uh, make an appointment with that local conservationist to, to visit with you at the farm, 
And uh, that's the, the very first step. What that step looks like uh, a little more deeply is uh, the conservationist will visit with the farmer. They walk the piece of property together. They, first of all, will listen to the landowner trying to discern what are the objectives, what are the problems, what are the issues that that farmer is concerned about, would like to address. Uh, the conservationist also provides another set of eyes to be able to look at that landscape and identify other issues and concerns that maybe are not readily apparent or to the, to the landowner. And so um, what will happen then is that conservationist is then able to offer technical assistance in the form of suggestions or alternative practices that might be considered to treat that, that resource concern. So for example, uh, let's just say that uh, the farmer and, and the conservationists have walked the property. They've identified uh, there on the left-hand column some resource concerns, gully erosion, compaction, soil erosion. The conservationists will then suggest some alternative practices that are science-based um, that can be used to address that particular resource concern. And, um, and so the the farmer is the one who will ultimately make the decision on which of the alternatives that they feel best fits their operation. We take those decisions and we package those in what's called a conservation plan. Essentially, this is just a business plan for that operator to use to, to address their conservation objectives. The conservationists will provide some technical specifications on how to specifically implement that practice. And also there's a schedule of when that landowner has decided to, to install that practice. The conservation plan is really a, an essential part in that farmer's journey also to, uh, to take the next step to secure financial assistance to install the practices they've decided to use. Uh, let's stop briefly along the road and talk about financial assistance. NRCS has a variety of, of assistance types. Uh, two of the more popular working land programs are the Environmental Quality Incentive Program and the Conservation Security Pro Stewardship Program, excuse me. And if, uh, if you just do a quick internet search, typing in NRCS financial assistance programs, uh, some information should pop up uh, on that search. Let's take a brief look at EQIP. It is one of the workhorse uh, working lands programs. EQIP's designed to provide financial assistance to help that farmer install the practices they've decided to use and that are recorded in their conservation plan. And the practices are designed to improve water, air, soil quality, but also to reduce soil erosion, sedimentation issues, and also to improve and create wildlife and forestry habitat. CSP is much like that with a couple different uh, aspects to it. Uh, stewardship program provides financial assistance to that farmer to maintain the conservation work they have already done and then uh, improve it or take it to the next level by providing some additional incentives to install more conservation practices to address other priority resource concerns. Three special considerations I wanna to touch on is that are especially available for beginning farmers are funding pools, payment rates, and advanced payments. Funding pools um, are the way NRCS takes uh, its allocation from our national office and, and breaks it down and puts it in different buckets. So when Ohio receives a, an EQIP allocation, it's one big wad of money. We take that and, and break it down into these different funding pools. And beginning farmers are a very specific funding pool that, that funds are dedicated towards. So when an applicant comes into our office and applies for EQIP, they can participate in any one of these funding pools for which they're eligible. 
But the nice thing for beginning farmers is they only compete with other beginning farmers. They're not competing with other, other buckets, if you will. So there's dedicated funding that NRCS makes available to beginning farmers. Higher payment rates are another incentive that NRCS provides to beginning farmers. In the traditional or typical EQIP contract, if a, for example, a farmer uh, selects to use cover crops, uh, that farmer is reimbursed uh, $51 per acre after they've installed that cover crop practice. Beginning farmers actually will receive a higher rate to offset additional risk to, to install that conservation practice. So beginning farmers receive a higher payment rate. And finally, advanced payments. Traditional EQIPS um, reimburses a farmer after they have installed the conservation practice. So that farmer has to use out of pocket money to install the practice and afterward are reimbursed when that practice has been installed. The nice feature for advanced payments, especially for beginning farmers, is that beginning farmer can apply for an advanced payment that provides money to buy the inputs necessary to put the practice on the ground without using out-of-pocket money. And so this is kind of a nice feature for beginning farmers is that uh, they don't have to rely so much on out-of-pocket costs and other, other sources to install the practice. All right, so we've, uh, we've touched on who NRCS is, the type of assistance that are available, a quick look at the programs that uh, are typically used by beginning farmers. Uh, the, how do we get in touch with NRCS? Well, if you do a, a quick internet search for USDA Office Locator, um, a website will, will come up and you can select the county that uh, you own or operate in. And once you click on the county, another web page will, will shine and uh, give you the specific contact information for that local office, the phone number, address, and you further can uh, touch on the, click on the uh, agency that you might specifically want to uh, contact. Also, NRCS has a, a web page here in Ohio. A quick internet search for NRCS Ohio will, will pop that up. A variety of information available there as well. And as Kirk said, a really nice resource that we would like you to, to check out is the farmers.gov uh, site uh, specifically developed for beginning farmers and provides just a, a great uh, wealth of information. And uh, Carrie, that's it. I will turn it back to you. All right, thank you, Doug. And um, Molly dropped in the chat uh, the link to the USDA Service Center uh, locator website that Doug referred to. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, Risk Management Agency. Jessica? Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jessica Hyen and I am a risk management specialist within the Springfield, Illinois regional office. So because I'm in the regional office, I actually sit on the Illinois, Indiana, Michigan and Ohio beginning farmer rancher team. So to get started, I'm excited to be able to provide an overview of the federal crop insurance programs and policies offered to new and beginning farmers and ranchers or veteran farmers and ranchers from the USDA Risk Management Agency. So what does the Risk Management Agency do? Well, we manage the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, otherwise known as FCIC, to provide innovative crop insurance products to America's farmers and ranchers. We're committed to increasing the availability and effectiveness of federal crop insurance as a risk management tool and we serve America's agricultural producers through effective market-based risk management tools to strengthen the economic stability of ag producers and rural communities. While the RMA offers up a variety of products and policies for producers, we have a couple of very important programs that are tailored to new farmers, specifically the beginning farmer 
rancher, the beginning farmer and rancher, BFR, and the veteran farmer and rancher, VFR programs. In the next couple of slides, we're gonna talk about the difference between the two programs and the benefits that each possess. So what qualifies you to be a BFR for RMA? So for RMA, a BFR is an individual who has not actively operated and managed a farm or ranch with an insurable interest in a crop or livestock as an owner operator, landlord, tenant, or sharecropper for more than five years um, or 10 years for the whole farm um, program. So the five crop years or 10 crop years for the WFRP includes an insurable interest as an individual or as a substantial beneficial interest holder, 10% or more. And another person who has an insurable interest in any crop or livestock and excludes crop years when the BFR was under the age of 18, enrolled in post-secondary studies or was active duty in the US military. Now that we've established what a BFR is, we'll now move on to what qualifies you to be a VFR. An individual who has served on active duty in the Marine Corps, Air Force, and Coast Guard, including the reserve components, was discharged or released under conditions other than dishonorable and qualifies under any of the following. Has operated a farm or ranch for not more than five years, is a veteran who has first obtained status as a veteran during the most recent five-year period, even if that veteran has previously operated a farm or ranch for more than five years. And please note, a spouse's veteran status does not impact whether an individual is considered a VFR. Additionally, a person other than an individual may be eligible for veteran or farmer rancher benefits only if all substantial beneficial interest holders qualify as a VFR. You may be wondering, how do these pro programs help you? Well, these programs help beginning or veteran farmers and ranchers successfully enter into farming and ranching by providing support for the education, mentoring, and technical assistance projects that gives them the knowledge, skills, and tools they need to make the best possible informed decisions for their operations. Now that we've established what a BFR or VFR is and how our programs will help them, let's go over the benefits that come with being a BFR or VFR. So um, these basically um, establish that you are exempt from paying the admin fee for cat and buyout policies. You receive an additional 10 percentage points of premium subsidy or buyout policies that have premium subsidy. You can use the previous producer's production history for specific acreage transferred to you if you were previously involved in the decision making or physical activities on any farm that produced the crop or livestock. And um, you get an increase in the substituted yield for yield adjustment, which allows a replacement of a lower yield um, due to an insured cause of loss from 60 to 80% of the applicable T yield for the crop in the county. Now that we're going to get into the basics of how these two programs um, differ. So the benefits for BFR and VFR are essentially the same, um, except the qualifications for the two are different. You may qualify for both VFR and BFR, but the programs are not interchangeable and you can't receive benefits from both at the same time. So can anyone other than an individual qualify for BFR or VFR? Well, business entities may receive VFR benefits if only all the substantial business interest holders um, qualify. So for example, a veteran moves home to take over the family farm and incorporates with his or her spouse and neither have previous farming experience, their corporation would qualify for those VFR benefits. 
And the same thing for a BFR. Um, you know, if a son moves home to take over the family farm and incorporates with his spouse and neither previously um, had any farming experience, their corporation would qualify. However, um, let's just say if a son moves home um, for BFR, if a son moves home for and forms a corporation with his father who has had an insurable interest in crops or livestock for more than five years, the corporation cannot receive any VFR benefits. Although the son qualifies, the father does not. So the corporation wouldn't qualify for VFR benefits. And the same goes for VFR as well. So now that we've gone over the qualifications, eligibility and differences, how do you get started? Well, take a trip to meet up with your insurance agent of choice and fill out the application by said agent. So you would want to fill out the application provided by your crop insurance agent. You must disclose any previous farming or ranching experience in any exclusionary periods under the age of 18 in college or active duty military. And the application must be completed prior to the sales closing date for the benefit to be available for that crop year. In conclusion, the RMA website has a lot of great tools and resources available at your fingertips. Under the topics tab in the blue drop down, the very first topic you'll see listed is the BFR VFR programs. And within that, there's an FAQ page that's very thorough and in-depth. And I strongly recommend that you take a look at that. Another great tool is the find an agent tab at the top of the screen. It allows you to find a local licensed crop insurance agent who sells and service crop insurance policies in your area. And in conclusion, here's the link to the RMA website and my contact information. Please feel free to reach out with any questions. I would love to chat and help you find the resources you're looking for. And thanks for joining me to learn about the new farmer programs that the RMA has to offer. I hope you all have a great day. All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Jessica. And our final 10 minute presentation is uh, Jennifer's going to talk to us about rural development. Thanks, Gary. So good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Brown. I'm a business program specialist with USDA Rural Development um, here in Ohio, and I serve as the final member of our Ohio Beginning Farmer Team. Um, rural development is an agency that's here to support the rural communities, and we kind of focus on three different areas in our support. Um, we help with housing assistance. Um, community and rural business assistance. So I kind of focus my attention on the business side of things. Um, and I'll focus on two specific programs um, that benefit the beginning farmers um, here in Ohio and across the country. So the first one we're going to kind of cover is called the Rural Energy for America program, also known as REAP. Um, this program was authorized under the Agriculture Act of 2014, offering funding for audits, uh, provide assistance for uh, energy development and making those energy efficiency improvements and install renewable systems to the operation. Uh, for this fiscal year, uh, FY 2022, uh, there's a total of 57 million available nationwide. And then each state receives an allocation for that. So Ohio's allocation for this fiscal year is 1.3 million. So what this program does is the purpose of it is to help those agriculture producers or rural small business reduce their energy costs or consumption. So they can do that by applying um, through a, either a grant or a loan guarantee program. Um, they can have two different, they can apply through two different ways. One is a renewable energy system, and then the other is energy efficiency improvement. Uh, we'll kind of cover what each of them, those are here in the future slides, but just keep in mind, these are not intended for any kind of residential purposes. Um, I know some farm operations can contain uh, just kind of one meter for the whole operation. Um, so we can kind of portion out, but we cannot cover any of that residential. So the eligible criteria, um, you either have to be a agriculture producer or a rural small business. Um, we can't do any kind of municipalities, schools, um, governments, anything like that. You have to be located in a rural area um, and that can be located on our website or reach out to me. 
And then these projects have to be commercially available. So it can't be something that you came up with on a napkin or anything. They've got to be something that's available. Um, the warranties are provided and they're up and working um, after they're installed. So we kind of covered, there's two different ways you can apply for the REAP program. There's a grant um, under the renewable energy, there's a maximum of 500,000 and the energy efficiency is 250,000. Um, these are tax deductible, so you will receive a 1099 um, at the beginning of the next year, or you can apply for a loan guarantee. So what a loan guarantee is, it kind of Kurt covered it with the Farm Service Agency. Ours is quite similar to that. So you'll have a bank. Um, maybe they're not quite you know, comfortable putting solar on your operation or something. So you would go to them, actually apply to them for a guarantee, um, and then they would provide um, the paperwork to us, and we provide a protection up to 85%. So should something happen down the road, um, that bank's kind of protected a little bit more than what they would have been without it. Um, and they're a little bit more comfortable expending, um, uh, extending that credit to you. There is a small fee, a 1% fee at closing, and then an annual renewal fee of 20 um, or a quarter percent each year. Um, our total involvement can't exceed 75%. So if you do wanna do a grant and a loan guarantee, uh, the grant would be 25%, loan guarantee 50, and then you would still have to have your skin in the game with the, the remaining 25%. So the two different applications, like we said, you can reply for the uh, renewable energy. Um, the big ones we see here in Ohio um, are solar and um, anaerobic digesters are kind of the two that we see um, on the renewable side of things. Um, we don't see much of wind anymore. Uh, we kind of did years back, but they do kind of contain a lot of um, maintenance and stuff. So everybody's kind of switched over to the solar. Um, we do see some of the pellet mills, you know, we see some of the greenhouses and stuff like that where they'll go and, you know, heat their greenhouse um, with firewood or pellets or something like that, the biomass boilers, um, and that's become in real handy. The energy efficiency side of things, um, it kind of used to be known as the grain dryer replacement uh, program. Um, we kind of expanded that um, and kind of look at it as, you know, anything you have on your operation um, that you can replace and provide a more efficient way of operating it, um, that's something that you can apply for. So if you have a, um, you know, an old dairy barn that you're milking out of or something and you need new motors, new lights, insulation, curtains, anything like that, um, we can take a look at it um, with an energy audit to show that, you know, after the improvements are made, that there will be a, an improvement on the efficiency. So that could be something that could be green eligible. So with the grant program um, that's specific to these two dates, there's a, great, or a deadline twice a year. Uh, the next deadline is October 31st. Um, and then the next one would be March 31st of 2023. Um, the loan guarantee program were looked at on a monthly basis. So um, we took those to the national office and they're actually um, reviewed and approved um, kind of in, in coordination with them. Uh, the website there, uh, you can find additional information about the REAP program or some of the other programs, but we're going to fall into the next program that benefits beginning farmers, which is called the Value Added Producer Grant. And this was covered, um, it's been around for many years, um, but it was kind of renewed in the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, this is a nationally competitive program. Um, this year, our funding um, nationwide is 19.75 million. So there's 17 million in general funds and then 2.75 in COVID relief funds. Um, we had some funding last year that was COVID relief and these are just leftover funds that they're using. Um, each year there is a NOSA that'll be published and released um, inviting applications and giving deadlines on when those applications are due and we'll include any maybe updated information or any targeted funding that might be available. So as I mentioned, it's a national competition. We do receive the applications here in Ohio. Um, I'm in the lead of the program here in Ohio. So I'll receive the applications, uh, work on them, review them, score them. And then we send them up for um, another two reviews or scoring and then they're competed nationally. When you're applying for the value added producer grant, there's two ways of applying for funding. You know, if you have um, an idea that you're wanting to maybe incorporate on your operation, we can look at that as a planning grant. So you're not really ready to do it. You're kind of thinking, you know, is it feasible? Is it, is it something I want to explore? Um, you can use a planning grant up to $75,000 grant request. 
or if it's something that you're kind of already doing, but you're like, hey, I want to expand my customer base and kind of, you know, throw that fishnet out a little wider, then we can look at working capital grants. Um, we did recently come up with an option of a SIMF applied application. So those grant requests of under 50,000 have less paperwork. So that makes it nice, um, you know, for those that maybe aren't requesting as much, you don't have to have as, as much of the uh, business plans or feasibility studies. So with a regular funding, there is a one-to-one -one match. So if you're wanting, um, you know, a $100,000 project, uh, you could re request the $50,000 grant, and then you would have to have the remaining 50,000 um, skin in the game, either by a cash match or an eligible in-kind match that could be, um, as the owner, it could be part of your time. Um, it could be the product itself. So if you're, you know, if you're raising strawberries and you're, you know, saying so many pounds of strawberries um, are going into this project, we can, we can value those as an in-kind match as well. Our grant periods are up to 36 months. And um, deadlines are released each year, as I said earlier, in our NOSA. Um, this past round was just due at the beginning of May, and I'm kind of working through those applications now. Um, we'll get those scored in the next couple months. And then usually by August or September, we're making the announcements or working with the applicants on awarding those funds um, and starting those grants um, to get those in operation. So what is this? So this is an, um, it enables agriculture producers to develop businesses that produce a market value added products. Um, you know, I think we'll go into uh, some examples here, but you know, if you are a beef producer that does freezer beef, um, we'll be listening to Abby Turner here in a little bit. Um, she does the mushrooms and other produce and she, she uh, markets those with a value added product. Um, we have uh, some honey, uh, we have bee uh, keepers that take the propolis out of honey and make different products of those and expand that market. So there's quite a variety of things that we can look at under the value added producer grant. So as an agriculture producer, you have to be an individual and you have to be fully engaged in that operation um, on a day to day base. So there's different ways of applying, um, but each member that's applying for the grant has to be part of the labor, the management, you know, in the, in the day in and day out. So just keep that in mind um, as you're applying for the grant or have a group of you applying together. So these are the different ways that you can apply. Your, uh, our most normal here in Ohio is the independent producer. Um, that's, your, that's your produce grower or your beef producer. Um, you know, that's, that's the individual, individual farmer. Um, we do have agriculture producer groups. Um, farmer and rancher co-ops and majority controlled. Um, you know, those are some that are a little different. I, if you are part of a group or a co-op or something like that, please reach out to me and we can talk a little about those in deed or greater detail. They're a little bit harder to explain, but we can definitely go over those individually. Um, applicants must demonstrate what they own and produce, and they have to be able to own and produce more than 50% of their product. Um, so if they're, you know, uh, raising those strawberries, over 50% of what are they're putting into their value added product has to be grown on their operation. Um, and then the main thing we wanna see is, you know, it's gonna increase your customer base. So you have to demonstrate that in your application and your template, you know, how you're gonna increase that customer base. So the two ways we talked about um, applying, we have the planning grant. So what those eligible costs can cover is uh, listed there, the business plan feasibility study marketing study, legal, and other guidance. Um, and like, like I said, those are just kind of pre-planning. You're not sure you want to do it. So you want to kind of, you know, put these, put these plans together or studies together in place to see if it's something viable that you want to continue with. And then we have the working capital grant. So this is, you know, the more one that we uh, see around um, application-wise here in Ohio, but it provides funding for eligible expenses to operate um, and for processing and marketing of that product. Um, so, you know, there's eligible startup costs, um, legal costs, marketing, it helps pay some salaries, finance inventory. Um, we can do some equipment, but it's very limited. Um, we say it can't be something that is uh, bolted down and, you know, is, is there permanently. You know, if it's something, a set of scales or, um, you know, a lot of people ask for refrigerators. We can't do the big, you know, walk-ins, but we can do some of the units, um, you know, that are staying alone uh, under five thousand dollars. 
and what's not eligible. So we can't help with paying for like a grant writer to help with your application. Um, unfortunately, we can't do any kind of construction, purchase land. Uh, we can't help pay for the product itself. So, you know, if you're wanting to put out another five acres of strawberries, um, we're not able to do that. So I kind of look at this and keep in mind is like the farm gate forward. Um, so you've already harvested your product and now you're taking it for processing, um, you know, uh, whether it's to, uh, you know, free, to make it to the freezer beefs, that kind of processing, or you're taking it yourself. But after you harvest it, moving forward is kind of where this grant um, comes into play. So types of eligible product. Um, we, as I said earlier, we've done a variety of things. Um, you know, you can do Christmas trees, fruits and vegetables, poultry, uh, honey. Um, as I said, we've done the strawberry. We have the, the uh, presenter here later on that's doing a shiitake mushrooms. Um, so, I mean, it, you know, the sky's kind of the limit as long as it's an agriculture produced product that you're adding value to or kind of looking at as a local type um, food to, to customers. We can't do anything with like uh, pets or horses or anything like that. And then there is my contact information. Um, you can reach out to me by email or pick up the phone and give me a call. If you have further questions, I'd be happy to go through those with you. Um, what I do kind of encourage you to do, if it's something that you're wanting to, uh, to explore, maybe next go around, uh, reach out to me. I like to get involved as um, the earlier, the better. I'll help you fill out your application. If you get it into me, I would say within, oh, two to three more weeks of the uh, grant deadline, I'll kind of go through it and see, you know, is it a complete application? Are there items that I see that might be missing? Um, is there something that I could say, you know, might want to clarify it a little bit more? Um, you know, that's why I'm here is to assist you. So um, appreciate a real action in Ohio State and OFA uh, putting this on today and including um, the Ohio Beginning Farmer Group. So Carrie, back to you, thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Jennifer. All right, it is 11. So we're going to go ahead and get started again. Um, so now we're going to go into a Q&A. So we're going to get to ask the, uh, the representatives from the various USDA agencies a bit more about you know, what they do, what programs they offer. Um, there's also a few questions in the chat that we're gonna get to, but we've also prepared some questions um, that we hope will help you get a little bit more information uh, out of this whole thing. So if you're ready to start, our first question is walk me through how to get a farm number. All right, and I think I'll, I'll jump in with that because uh, the farm numbers kind of fall in the farm service agency arena. Um, so your first step for, the, for how to obtain a farm number, uh, obviously this will have to be done through the, the local office. Um, and a few of the things you'll need are proof of uh, access to the land. So that could be um, proof of ownership, whether it's a deed, uh, could be a proof of a lease, uh, sometimes that's as simple as party A signing something that says, uh, you know, party A agrees to lease this land to party B and it's signed. Doesn't have to have any of the details, um, you know, any of that type of stuff uh, laid out there, but just evidence that you have access to that parcel of land. Um, then the folks at our local county office will actually help you uh, delineate out which acres are farmland acres, and then they will set up uh, the property with a farm number, uh, get you the eligibility paperwork that you need to fill out and, uh, and move forward with um, helping you out with the applicable programs that may be of interest. Perfect, thank you. Um, I do see that Tia's hand is up. Sorry, I do wanna honor that and go ahead, please. Yes, thank you, August. Um, so I have a question. You said that uh, you need to have proof that you have access to the land. So if you're the owner, you would bring in the deed, for example, or if you're renting, you would bring in a lease agreement. So how would you determine that the lease agreement I have that the owner actually owns the land if, if I didn't provide a deed for, you know, with their name on it? Sure. Uh, it's a great question. And, and actually, I should also expound upon a lot of times 
uh, the reference is, is made to the county auditor's website and, uh, and that information is taken by our county office. Uh, a deed may be necessary if our purchase agreement may be necessary if it's a, a recent transaction that hasn't hit the, the, um, the auditor's site yet. But typically, they'll verify ownership off the auditor's site. Good question. Thank you. So just to clarify, you wouldn't actually need a deed if, like, for example, I've owned my land for 10 years, you can get that information from the auditor's site. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That was a good follow up question too. Um, the next question we have are, are there any programs or benefits for beginning farmers or farmers of color? Now, I know a lot of um, people touched on that, so I'm just going to give them an opportunity to speak further if they'd like. So I know with like rural development, um, there are some, most of our programs or the grant programs you can apply as like a socially disadvantaged farmer. Um, and that falls under that criteria. So, you know, that can be, I know there was a question in the chat box, that could be a woman-owned farmer. Um, it could be a farmer of color. Um, you know, if it's been the past of socially disadvantaged, then and those priority points um, could possibly be awarded, um, you know, if they're available for that grant program, at least for rural development. Each, each agency does have a little bit different regulations um, and requirements, so I would highly encourage you to reach out to that agency um, and kind of see where they stand with each of them. Yes, August, for, for, for NRCS, we do uh, make... Um, you know, if I go back to my presentation on uh, the various buckets or uh, what we call funding pools, um, one of those buckets is socially disadvantaged and uh, farmers of color would fit that definition and would be able to compete for equip dollars um, with other disadvantaged farmers. Yeah, for Farm Service Agency, um, our programs are typically eligible across the spectrum, but like Doug had stated, uh, we have um, targeted uh, funding pools and uh, that reserves uh, funds back to make sure that the, the uh, uh, certain targeted groups are actually eligible or that are eligible would be um, able to obtain funds throughout the entirety of the year, even if funds in another pool may, may run out uh, due to demand. Um, again, we have the beginning farmer a down payment program, which also touches on SDA and veteran farmers. Um, as far as any other eligibility, we have the, the uh, TIP program, which is a transition incentive program, which actually allows for folks that uh, are uh, pulling a, a tract of land out of the conservation reserve program for whatever reasons, uh, gives them an incentive to transition that to a beginning farmer or rancher. And uh, uh, what that does is allows for the continuation of their annual rental payment for an additional two years. Uh, and that's an application process held through uh, and, and taken through the uh, local county office. Good afternoon. And the RMA is pretty limited. Um, <laughs> uh, we don't, I mean, our programs just basically encompass all new, new beginning farmers. Um, good afternoon, um, everyone. My name is Sophia Bugs. I'm located in Mahoning County. If you have applied in the past, would you still need the same again to reapply for some of the resources that are available, um, which are the programs sound very similar and the same as before, but would you still need to bring in new information if you've already applied in the past? So for FSA programs, uh, since they run off of annual certification, annual crop certification, uh, that's typically an annual signup. Uh, so we run a lot of annual signups. Now there are programs such as our, our conservation reserve program that are multi-year programs. And those would uh, continue on with an annual payment on a single signup over a period of time. But um, for our, our um, our commodity programs, those are typically uh, one year programs, so they would be something you'd sign up for annually. Thank 
with real development, um, as long as you're applying for uh, a different project under the value added or the REAP, um, you know, and, and those priority points are still there and available by all means, you know, that's, that's why they're there. So as long as a new project um, that you're applying for, uh, yeah, we can do that. And I want to highlight something that Doug said in the chat that each USDA agency um, and its programs have their own criteria and definition. So if you're interested in one of these, just make sure you're reaching out to um, your local office so they can give you some more information. Um, I'll also say in my personal experience, I found that the definition of socially disadvantaged can vary across uh, programs and agencies. Um, so that's another thing to look out for to make sure uh, you got the distinction. Are there any more follow-up questions or comments to this question? All right, next question is, how do these programs relate to the Farm Bill? I'll lead off again here. Uh, the uh, FSA programs obtain their funding uh, a multitude of different ways. Um, so we have the Farm Bill, which will appropriate uh, certain funds for certain programs. And, uh, and it will establish programs to run for the duration of the Farm Bill. Uh, the Farm Bill also allocates uh, what's called discretionary funds. Discretionary funds are uh, set aside in the event that we have a need for ad hoc programs. And we've seen a lot of that lately. And a lot of those funds have come from the discretionary budget that's outlined within the Farm Bill. Uh, and then finally, we have our statutory programs, which are our loan programs. Uh, those are funded through the annual budget. Uh, and they are, they are actually, um, the changes the Farm Bill makes to those programs are more on the, the line of eligibility, uh, but are not uh, availability based on through the Farm Bill. I think I'll, I'll try to, to add a little bit to that. Um, I kind of envision the Farm Bill is like a cherry pie. Um, it's one big cherry pie. Um, but that cherry pie gets carved up and there's big pieces and there's small pieces. But each of those pieces is, is a part of um, a conservation program. Some of, the, the doll, the, some of those pieces are mark conservation, some of them are mark crop insurance. Some of the pieces of that pie are marked for nutritional programs. Some are, are marked for crop insurance. So the farm bill is one big pie, but it gets carved up and, and dispersed to different programs that USDA uses. That was a, that's a good overview of what the, the Farm Bill kind of does. Um, and then the Farm Bill comes out, you know, they, they kind of revise it every five years. So the next one is in 2023. So a lot of new stuff coming up. All right, next question. When can I sign up for these programs? And is there a deadline or can you sign up throughout the year? So I think that really, um, so, okay, go ahead, Jessica. I was just going to say, I kind of touched on this in my presentation. Um, you, for crop insurance, you just have to um, ha be signed up before your applicable sales closing date. And I think you just kind of have to target what you're looking for and reach out because, you know, even all of our programs uh, vary. Um, you know, whether we have one application deadline a year or multiple or it's a uh, reoccurring. So I think if you find something that you're interested in doing, you just got to reach out to each agency um, and find what those deadlines are. Yeah, for NRCS, for the EQIP and CSP, which are our working lands programs, we accept applications for those programs year round. So you can apply for, for those programs at any time during the year. Um, when NRCS receives its allocation for EQIP and CSP, we, we have to draw a line in the sand saying that we're gonna evaluate all the applications that we have received up until this point. 
and then just select the, uh, the applications that we wish to fund, and then we will allocate that funding across those contracts. So you can sign up at any time, but at some point we, we use the funds that are given to us and, and share those with our contract holders. Yeah, and I'll echo a lot of what's been said already, but um, FSA's programs, uh, depend, it's, it's very dependent on the program. So some programs have a sign-up period, uh, some have a, you know, a deadline. Uh, it, it really just depends on what you're looking for. Uh, crop certification, there's a deadline to certify crops. Um, you know, depending on which crop it is, it gets that specific. So uh, when it comes down to what you want to do, when you want to do it, and how you want to do it, uh, it really is best to contact your local office uh, with a, a list of, of maybe what you're thinking about doing and, and really being open to having a conversation about what can be provided to fit those needs and when that needs to be done. Thank you all for that. Um, so those are the questions that we had prepared. And I know we got one of the answers to a participant question about the, our women socially disadvantaged farmers. I did see another question in the chat. And if you have other questions that have come up throughout this, feel free to unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat and we will go through those now. So one of the questions that came up in the chat is if you apply for a planning grant and it is awarded, can you apply for a working capital grant in the future? Sure, so that's in reference to the value added producer grant. So yeah, that's kind of what we're intending it for it to be. So if it's something that you're doing the planning grant for and you're ready to move forward, um, you can apply for that working capital the following year. And you can apply for other working capital grants beyond that, as long as you have a different project. So keep that in mind too. You can be a reoccurring applicant, um, as long as you're kind of changing it up some or changing your product, um, you can apply more than once then too. Does anybody else have any other questions that have come up or something that you might want clarified from the presentations that people had? I will ask, is there anybody that was on the panel that would like to expand on anything that they have said as well? Um, my question is, this is Sophia. Um, very grateful for all the resources that are being shared and offered. Is there some outreach efforts happening? I know this would be considered an outreach effort because OFA absolutely touches a lot of new beginning farmer ranchers consumers and people overall who are really interested in food. But other than that, um, and the 11 sites that are um, being chosen to somehow get this information and resource out, but are the county offices also outreaching uniquely for their county for this specific or these specific resources or farmers who they are already currently knowing exist and are working with? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and obviously one uh, that's the last couple of years has put a little bit of a bind on and we've gotten creative in, in outlets like this, but our local offices are given uh, outreach budgets every year. Uh, they do, uh, are they are encouraged and, and uh, as part of their performance part of their job description to conduct outreach uh, to local organizations, local events, um, whether they are, uh, you know, the county fairs or uh, any type of uh, uh, trade shows, uh, anything like that. There are, um, uh, there are actually, uh, we call them gov delivery newsletters that are sent out monthly by each office. And that is something that can be, uh, you can sign up for to the county office to receive that. That's information that's put out uh, that, that may touch on a, ver a variety of, of topics. Um, and then finally, we, we also have um, 
are beginning from a rancher team, you know, in our various respects, we're working on different outreach uh, opportunities to help enhance what our local offices are doing. So um, I guess the, the short answer to your question is yes, they are doing um, outreach. Uh, it's, it's as always a continual work in progress. And, um, you know, I would encourage you that if you have uh, events or, or happenings that are going to be in your area that you'd like somebody to participate in to reach out to your local offices or to one of us or any of us and uh, we'd be happy to coordinate uh, some USDA presence for that outreach event. August, this is Doug. Um, maybe one, one thing that we can do is I would like to know from our from our guests today where they go to get information about resources that are available to them as beginning farmers. That that would help us as as an agency. Where do you go to get information about um, resources that are available to you, and so that we can plug into those those sites or outlets. Yeah, that's that's great. And that's a really good question too. Let let me, it looks like Tia has her hand up. Um, I'll let her go ahead and ask her question first. Go ahead. Sure, it was just a follow-up. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it was just a follow-up to uh, Sophia's question and how Kurt actually answered the question. Uh, you said that USDA can be available to speak to groups. Would that be virtual or can we actually have someone come to our organization and, and present? So uh, either or, uh, we've done uh, both ways in the past. We're currently doing both ways. Um, some of it's dictated by the area. Now, right now, fingers crossed, we're in good shape with, uh, you know, what restrictions we may have with, with public health, but, um, you know, that obviously can change at any moment. But uh, if, if it's an in-person presence that you're wanting, uh, that's certainly something that we can work on coordinating. And, and I'll follow up by saying, too, that we do have a few other efforts uh, going on in the summertime that are in-person. Uh, or plan to be in person. So uh, hopefully that becomes more commonplace as we as we move forward. Great. Thank you for all your questions. These are these were really good. And I like uh, Doug, I like your idea of um, kind of sourcing, you know, where are people finding their information if it is not currently USDA. Um, and maybe how you know that can be changed. Uh, what we're going to do um, is we have a few presenters who are going to talk about how they utilize some of these programs, which help you get a, a bit more of an insight into into what they are and what they can do. Um, so we'll have them present. We'll have an opportunity for you all to ask questions. Okay, wonderful. Um, like I said, we're going to go into these farmer profiles, and we are going to start with Lindsay. Hi, I'm Lindsay. We have True Vibe Farm down in Athens. We've been there for about five years, and uh, we have 80 acres, mixed woods and pasture. We graze another up to 100 acres, mostly beef cows. We do have some goats and some poultry, um, and then we also do... Um, heirloom seed crops, like contract seed crops for seed companies. And um, we have an on-farm state licensed food processing space where I make chocolate and I've made vegan cheese and other things. Um, so the biggest projects we've done, we got right in from like year one to equip. And uh, the first projects were perimeter fencing, which was critical to keep the cows off the road. Um, we added some water points and then uh, a wastewater system for the milk house. So we we're going to do dairy. That's on pause indefinitely right now. And um, then last year, we also added a high tunnel uh, to protect our seed crop production because you need dry conditions in the fall, which we don't have here. So 
It's not okay for noise, guys. Somebody decided to weed back next to the window just now. <laughs> you guys can. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then oh, more recently, we've uh, signed on with um, CRP, which has been great because a lot of the practices we were already doing, so it really helped to get some funding to reinforce it and just make it make financial sense in addition to, you know, ecological sense. And then, um, so a lot of that has been things we're doing anyway, like clipping pastures, like our fescue to increase um, or improve the forage quality. We have to do it anyway. We have that endophyte infested fescue and we clip seed heads to reduce toxicity on the cows. So it's been really nice to just offset the diesel of doing that. Um, and uh, this year we're planting a half acre of pollinators and some food bearing perennials. Um, so we're doing an acre of uh, food bearing uh, like trees and bushes, presume like, you know, officially for human consumption, but it'll probably be a fair bit of animals sharing in that too. Um, and then some other CRP practices were frost seeding clover, which we were doing anyway. So that was nice to offset seed costs there um, in, our, in our pastures and um, eliminating pesticides, no problem. We weren't doing that anyway. So a lot of these projects, you know, um, infrastructure wise for EQIP has been critical. We, our farmers who worked for farms before, we didn't come in with a lot of cash. So um, being able to get, do the infrastructure projects and get them reimbursed has been huge to being able to uh, get our farm towards, you know, past the infrastructure building years and into more productive, profitable years. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, Experience-wise, I would say that toughest part is to for an equip program is that you have to you know do the whole practice. So say put up the high tunnel, pay for the equipment, pay for or the um, materials, pay for if you're having paying somebody to put it up or put it up yourself, pay for all that before you get reimbursed. So it can be pretty tricky. And um, we had done these practices in other states on other farms, so we knew that was coming. So a big part of budgeting for our farm was we put aside like 20K for equip programs. And then we spread out the practices to where you could do the practice, complete it, get the reimbursed, use it to fund the next practice. And so that's been a really important strategy because I think you could sign on for too much or not have that, you know, the funds to start with. Of course, you can get it, you know, you can get loans and things for that, but we wanted to do it with cash. So, um, yeah, and we worked with our local agents here in Athens who are fantastic and very helpful and spotted a lot of things we didn't and worked with us because sometimes the practices aren't necessarily designed for some of the quirky ways somebody might farm like us. And so that's been, they've just been super helpful. Um, making it work for us. And then I would say we also benefited hugely the um, folks that owned our farm that we bought it from were running a grass-fed uh, dairy for gosh, 30 years or so before us. And they benefit, they used a lot of equip like for hardened paths for the cows to walk because we have all these like hillsides and ridges and stuff. And it's really critical to keep those cow paths in good shape and water points. And so we definitely benefited from existing equip programs too. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Our next farmer is Tyler. Are you there, Tyler? I apologize. I was trying to hit unmute and the, the hand won't switch to the cursor often or fast enough. That is quite uh, My name is Tyler Gogoluk and uh, my business is Tyler's Farm. You can uh, view our website, tylersfarm.com um, for more specifics on this. We started this uh, hydroponic uh, lettuce operation um, I had the idea, you know, I was a, a part-time farmer. I worked full-time for, um, a large greenhouse operation. And, uh, when I went to look for funding to make this happen, uh, 
there were a few roadblocks which had led me to uh, Kurt Leber over at the Farm Service Agency. And um, one thing to keep in mind too is this is in, in so many ways of saying not traditional agriculture. Controlled environment agriculture is now more prevalent than it was when I was applying for my loan. But uh, it was a sell for Kurt because he was used to traditional, what we consider traditional grain crop, animal husbandry type farming. And um, we were able to utilize their direct farm lending from the FSA. Oh, one thing I'd like to throw in too, um, the, I think her name was Sophia, uh, along the way, besides looking to USDA for um, avenues of information, Lorain County Community College, their Small Business Development Center, their SBDC, a wealth of knowledge that are able to help you get to the point where you would go to FSA to obtain lending um, for whatever your um, dreams and aspirations were. But, you know, getting started was one thing, getting the lending was another thing, and then maintaining this along the way is, is, a, is a whole nother um, uh, feasibility. You know, I, I look at all the programs available and I thought, boy, along the way, I should have, uh, uh, you know, looked back a little bit more, you know, when it came to cooling, you know, when I built the facility, I didn't have a walk-in cooler. When I looked at pricing, oh my, so I made my own, um, you know, and ended up using, you can use a uh, air conditioning unit and buy a certain thing that keeps it from freezing and uh, boom, I have a walk-in cooler. Um, everything along the way also has been the our image, you know, we, we try to improve our image each year and you know we we from the first time we started we ended up rebranding our our logo and having to buy barcode labels which was a huge um endeavor in itself because not only do you make the purchase of the barcode label but you have to incorporate that into the label it has to be uh, according to USDA specs, because it's produce. So, you know, we had to bring in our marketing girl who does our website and everything handled all that for us. Um, things are always constantly changing. Um, with the advent of, of COVID and that, we had to turn to online sales. So setting that website up to um, administer sales and then have pick up locations was something new. Uh, also, I find that uh, the, the industry has changed a little where, you know, we are not just making, we did a lot of farmers markets. And now a lot of online sales are, are taking precedence of everything. Not a bad thing with the current uh, fuel prices the way they are, because you end up going to one location where everyone picks things up and distributing. So it's less time out of your, your day, but um, it, it's a shift in the way you do business. Um, and for us, I think Ohio State itself um, is a leader in controller, controlled environment agriculture right now. They just built a brand new facility in, in Columbus, and uh, it's, it's ever changing in a positive direction. I think um, you guys will find more um, operations that are, you know, centered around controlled environment agriculture starting to pop up in your um, uh, lending uh, portfolios. So, um, you know, we, we, we don't have days off either, even though it is controlled. Um, if you go to bed at night thinking everything's fine, something's wrong. It's, it's just like having toddlers running around. 
And, uh, you know, we, we just look to, to keep moving forward, adjusting with the times and, and uh, uh, growing fresh local produce, which is ever more um, in demand right now due to the fuel prices of getting everything from Salinas and Florida and all those other locales. So um, thank you. Thank you, Tyler. I'm gonna shop, stop sharing and try to fix my, my screen real quick before we move on. All right, are you able to see Yes. my full screen now? Oops. Okay. All right, um, we will move on to Abby Turner. Hi all. So my name is Abby Turner and I'm a mushroom farmer in Amesville, Ohio. And I utilize the processing facilities uh, for my value added project at AceNet in both uh, Athens and Nelsonville. Um, I have been the lucky recipient of two value added producer awards one past and one present. And I'm a strong proponent for these, these programs and working with the local USDA offices to make things happen. Um, uh, on my prior uh, VAPG, I worked with Deb Rausch uh, to produce a Lucky Penny Farm goat milk caramel or Cajeta. We did that in 2010. And then I'm now working on a project with Jennifer Brown uh, for mushroom harvest to do um, shiitake products. And uh, so that is currently ongoing. For our first value added producer grant um, written in 2010, we took goat milk um, produced from our farm and uh, cooked it down to make a, an absolutely delicious um, goat milk caramel. It's much like a dolce de leche, but made with goat milk. And uh, our grant was to help us market it um, produce the shelf stable product and uh, to go to a trade show, which is a wonderful thing that the VAPG can do. Um, we went to the fancy food show and we had many, many orders. Um, the most exciting one was we got a call from Oprah Magazine one day and they said, oh, you know, we want to include you in our, with the, I think it's called My Favorite Things. And um, they said, but you need to have a really strong e commerce portal. And this was back in 2010, you know, it wasn't so easy or inexpensive to set that up. And we didn't have that. So we didn't make it in the magazine, but it was fun to have that opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned, we did leave the fancy food show with, with many orders, but at a scale that, that my equipment and my company wasn't at yet. Um, but it did allow us to, to build some accounts and we are still producing that product to this day. Um, for chefs and restaurants and bakeries. So um, that was a successful project. The current project that we're on is through Mushroom Harvest Provisions and it's uh, brand development and marketing um, to utilize our waste product, which are the small mushrooms that we produce. Um, when she talked to in cores as we do it, um, the chefs wanna buy the big ones they don't want to fiddle with the little ones because it's more label, labor. So as our production increased, our waste increased as well. So this value-added producer grant allows us to take those smalls and do a variety of different things with it. Um, we have had great success pickling. Um, we have uh, come up with two recipes. Um, they're delicious. I'm thrilled about them um, on the progress to date. As I said, this is, this is an ongoing uh, grant right now. We also uh, are working to refine our fresh product to meet uh, chef specifications. They want tight mushrooms with the veil unbroken. Um, so, you know, making sure that we're, we're harvesting multiple times per day to meet um, specific chef needs based upon menus. We also have been taking the smalls and dehydrating them, um, which gives a much longer shelf life, which is wonderful because then we've moved out of, out of a perishable product into a, a shelf stable product. In addition, we're taking these one step farther 
and grinding the, these mushrooms into powders uh, to be used in uh, nutraceuticals or teas. Um, we're still experimenting with that. It's all about for us managing our waste and turning that waste product into additional income that comes back to the farm. So uh, we're ongoing on this project and um, it's, we've obviously had multiple delays because it's a crazy time to be doing a project. Um, glass jars have been very hard to find and source. Uh, we broke an oven and we couldn't get the parts. That was challenging. Uh, so there's been delays and then the whole team got COVID this spring. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're putting product out and we're thrilled about that. Um, um, we hope to be able to uh, capitalize the calendar and put product into the market for the holiday season this year. We've been doing our sales calls already to small retailers and people are really excited about the tests that we are doing and the products that are coming out. So I would say uh, helpful hints and tricks of the trade for applying for these grants or any other grants would be um, set aside time for yourself to physically write the grants. They don't happen quickly. They don't happen by accident. Um, I try to have a goal of one grant written per month and that's not always a big VAPG grant like this but it could be something smaller, um, a $500 grant there or you know, just something. That way I'm always keeping my content updated and um, always searching for additional grant opportunities. Um, in these grants, I think that I could say that things always cost more and take longer than you originally planned. And it's helpful if you ask for help from prior grant recipients. Say, hey, what worked for you? What didn't work for you? What was something that you would do differently? Uh, and uh, an additional piece of advice that I would suggest is get your numbers in order before you write, before you go to submit the grants. You should have your, your P&L, your balance sheet, um, you know, whatever your QuickBooks in order and your prior year's tax with a schedule F um, farm schedule completed uh, because those are the things that many of these grants do request. These grants are very time, very time consuming to apply for. Um, I know Lindsay who just spoke um, has also been a successful uh, grant recipient uh, for multiple products. And I, I would average between 40 and 60 dedicated hours for some of these bigger USDA grants. Um, and to do those, I built a team of support. I, I had folks right with me and um, I paid additional consultants to help me write. Uh, and I've always found that to be valuable and, um, and helpful even though sometimes the grant doesn't get funded, but you still have to pay the grant writer to, for the assistance. Um, but you don't have to do that. You can do it all yourself. So uh, I think takeaways are read the application completely, um, understand it, uh, verify the allowable expenses. And if you have any questions, reach out to your, your local USDA people, you know, the rural development folks, and you know, start a great communication and partnership. Talk to them early, talk to them often. Uh, you know, for this last mushroom grant, I had some questions. I reached out to Jennifer you know, a few weeks prior to the deadline and said, okay, here's, here's what I'm working with. What do you think? And uh, I, found, I found the availability to be very, very helpful. Um, I think it's also important that you get comfortable with grants.gov and SAM, which is the system award management, I believe, and uh, start working your way through the systems that are required uh, for the application process for uh, these, these federal grants. Um, so don't wait until the last minute to do it. They take time and they're monsters, but for us, it was a wonderful, source of free capital to put a pilot project or something we were thinking about into the market uh, without using uh, funds from, from, from the business. Because as a growing business, any funds that we're making or any profits that we're making, we're trying to invest right back in 
you know, for uh, more efficient equipment or more labor or uh, facility improvements. We're working out of a 150 year old dairy barn basement. So there's always improvements that need to be made there. So that's it. I'm always happy to help and answer any questions too, if anyone is interested in reaching out. Thank you. All right, thank you, Abby. Great information. And Isabel, you are up next. All right, am I unmuted? Yep, you are good. Well, hello, I'm not gonna take long. I wanted to introduce the Office of Partnership and Public Engagement. And in a, in, a, in a nutshell, we are the ones that do the outreach. As you saw, USDA has a lot of agencies and a lot of programs. What good is it if people don't know about it? <laughs> so I go into hurting communities and underserved communities and let them know what we offer. Connect them with the resources that USDA has. One of our flagship services is that we provide a, a scholarship for historically underserved people. We, we offer scholarships to underrepresented um, Blacks. We also have programs for Hispanics and tribal students. So we always reach out to underserved people. The scholarship that we offer is the 1890 scholarship program and it covers school tuition, room and board, books and fees. So anything related to the education. And then every summer, the internship is also provided. And at the end of the four years, there's the option to flip to a permanent job with USDA. That is just one of the um, programs. We also offer a lot of internship for students of any kind. Uh, with USDA, students as young as high school can apply for a job and get benefits and work for USDA. And that's one of the best kept secret. I don't know why it's a secret, but a lot of people don't know about it. So our goal is to eradicate poverty by providing educational opportunities for people. So the Office of Partnership and Public Engagement develops and maintains partnerships focused on solutions to challenges facing rural America and underserved communities in the United States and connects these communities to educational tools, resources available through USDA programs and initiatives. So we facilitate partnerships and offer education and resources to foster hope, opportunity, wealth creation, asset building in rural and underserved communities. And so we're called the Office of Partnership and Public Engagement because we realize that we don't know the community as well as maybe a nonprofit that has been there reaching out, addressing housing issues, opioid crisis, poverty, whatever it is. So we partner with these organizations. And then we begin doing our outreach through workshops and answering questions or any, any way that is available. That's how we promote our programs and what we do. I wanted to just share our vision. I don't want to have much time. So our, our vision is to provide, well, we provide leadership in food, agriculture, natural resources, rural development, nutrition, and related issues based on public policy, best available science, and effective management. What our vision is, is to provide economic opportunity through innovation, helping rural America thrive, to promote agricultural production that better nourishes Americans, while also helping feed others throughout the world and to preserve our nation's natural resources through conservation, restore forests, improve watersheds, and healthy private working lands. So I'm available for questions. Um, my job is easy. I just connect everybody with who they need to talk to. I know enough to be dangerous, 
but don't ask me any technical questions. And that's why we have all these program experts here. And without much ado, I'm done. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right, thank you so much, Isabel. And then we'll hear from our, our last speaker and then we'll have time for a few minutes of Q&A at the end. David Bright. Thank you very much. Um, I served as a uh, contract crop, uh, crop loss adjuster uh, for the last 15 years. Uh, in the private sector, we're um, approved insurance providers that are identified by RMA. And also in the governmental FSA side of things, we're NAP, um, where I've worked with, with about 70 different crops in the NAP program. Um, I am fifth generation of a sixth generation farm, family farm operation from Southwest Ohio. And I can definitely be the cheerleader uh, and encourage you all to uh, do the homework and, and get the awareness of the sources of knowledge that all these agencies provide to you because our family has been a benefactor of, of that knowledge. Um, I can share some real life experiences with uh, numerous programs um, mentioned by the earlier presenters. And I know our bottom line has probably increased by at least 10 or 15% uh, by applying some of those practices and some of the research and some of the management guidelines that were provided to us uh, through these agencies. Um, one thing I would mention too um, on some new, new uh, farmers is that uh, if you don't have the capital uh, for equipment and you want to seek someone to assist you like at a custom rate for use of a tractor or a planter or something along those lines, uh, there's an annual publication that OSU Extension has on annual custom rates and rental rates of lands and uses of equipment and services if it was tillage or something along those lines. So I really encourage you to take a look at that. If you don't want to venture into the big capital side, but you need somebody to do it, you might seek into that and see what the value uh, cost would be to do that. Uh, so I want to make sure uh, you're aware of that. The um, um, assistance is provided to all different producers uh, that, that are out there in terms of large, large producers, um, small farms, large farms, um, and conventional and organic farms. Um, our family operation linkage is uh, tied pretty much to, uh, I can go back in 1983 with the PIC program, which was an acronym for payment in kind. And payment in kind was one of those deals where they were trying to reduce the amount of crop acreage. So you put in a bid to set aside certain acreages for a certain price or per a certain yield. Uh, and from that practice, or from that program, we were able to uh, get our bid accepted and we stepped into the no-till uh, era in 1983. Um, the picture to the right with my daughter uh, is probably the fifth no-till um, product that or, or, or machinery that we've had for our operation. Um, We've also used the loan deficiency payment through FSA. Uh, we've used grain loans through the Commodity Credit Corporation, which ties to FSA. Um, we've used operating loans in the past uh, through uh, those programs. And we're active now in the income support tied to historical base crop acres uh, through ARC and PLC. Um, we've also had, as you can see in the background there, the farm storage. Uh, we use the farm storage loan uh, program as well. And through ODNR, uh, we've done a uh, Ohio Division of Forestry, we've done a woodland uh, management plan. And in that program, we were able to identify invasive species that through EQIP, we were able to control somewhat in, in terms of the Korean um, uh, honeysuckle that we're about. We also have uh, worked in the WIP program uh, with Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program where we had perimeter habitat enhancement through uh, Quail Unlimited. And uh, 
We've also done uh, CRP with some uh, streamside set aside plans to stabilize it. And during that CRP period, we've done a mid contract management where we've had pollinator habitat um, involvement and uh, got milkweeds established and tried some other uh, uh, pollinator species as well. Um, in more recent years, uh, when the there was quite a bit of rainfall in the 2018 time period, and there was a program uh, through private insurance called Prevented Planting. Well, there was an incentive provided uh, to do market facilitation program that would encourage you to do cover cropping, uh, cover crop uh, applications. And we used all of our set aside land from the prevented plant area where we couldn't get crops planted. Uh, we actually were able to get it all seeded down and uh, it helped in many ways in terms of uh, scavenging nutrients that, would, that were in the soil and also stabilizing the soil. Uh, we've, uh, my dad was one of the earlier ones that did uh, waterway uh, installation back in the 40s and 50s. Um, we've been involved in pond construction on our farm, uh, surface and subsurface drainage. Um, from the technical side of things, and there were dollars available in different programs over the years as well. So um, just want to encourage you that um, there are lots of avenues that can help you uh, along the way to be successful. And the more knowledge you have is power and, and that power will make you successful. Um, on the insurance side of things, uh, the NAP coverage, the Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program, they cover essentially everything from asparagus to, to zucchini and it covers uh, perennial crops as well as annual crops. Uh, herbs, uh, flowers, um, about everything under the sun really uh, will fit. And um, the TAP program is something that uh, I had uh, made assessments on, and that is a program that will replace rootstock damage. If you've had damaged uh, fruit trees, for instance, that they had a high mortality, uh, that is a program that you might qualify for for replacement. And in some cases I saw where there were fire blight damage to an apple orchard. And there also is funding through TAP for rehabilitation of damaged trees that can be salvaged and, and produced down the road and no need to replace brand new or, or new livestock root uh, there. Um, the, there are also programs that uh, I've been involved with on sugar maple taps uh, and honeybee uh, colony loss. Uh, so there are just a lot of avenues that can help you and as a new farmer, as a, as a niche farmer, that I really wanna encourage you to uh, investigate all these options for you. And probably the, one of the most important things I could say is, is that note all the important dates for all the programs which you may consider. You don't want to miss out on a deadline and, and cost yourself maybe, you know, an operational uh, uh, snafu there. And uh, I just want to encourage you to um, document those important dates as you go uh, to these agencies and, and shop for what might fit best for you. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all, really, um, for those wonderful presentations. That it was awesome. I I'm not necessarily a beginning farmer myself, but if I were, that would have been wonderful information to hear. Um, I said it in the chat, and I know we are over time, so I do want to respect your time. However, I also really want to respect all the knowledge that has just been offered. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I still want to give you all a few minutes to ask questions, um, you know, based on the presentations or in general. Um, we'll have a quick, you know, slide where you can get our contact information and we'll wrap up after that. Uh, but like I said, I do want to give you an opportunity to ask a few questions. So we will take that time now. In the chat, Julie had asked, um, who is the TAP program through? 
So the TAP program is administered through the Farm Service Agency as well. And T, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I'm just kind of curious, and I'm speaking to all of the representatives uh, from the different agencies. Um, I'm a little curious about the um, the percentage of uh, minorities that apply for these and um, actually apply for the programs and then also for the competitive ones um, actually are granted the uh, specifically the grants. So with our programs, um, you know, everybody has to submit the application equally. And then if they certify as um, a beginning farmer or um, in a um, in a socially disadvantaged, you know, they have to self-certify for that and they get extra priority points. They still compete overall with everybody um, nationally or across the state. And then we kind of start from the top score down. Um, so they're still in regular competition with everybody, but they might just get, you know, an extra 10, uh, 20 points based on what they're applying, um, applying as beginning farmer or socially disadvantaged. Does that answer your question, Tia? No, it actually doesn't. Um, I'm asking the percentage. Do you know the percentage of that are, that are granted actually? I do not know that offhand, but uh, if you want to get with me, I can definitely provide that to you. Um, I'm sure it's published annually every year um, from the national office, but we don't have anything locally, um, but I can definitely get that information to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Sure. If you have questions, you can, you can go off mute or put them in the chat. I actually have a question, um, kind of goes back to Doug's comment earlier, but I'm also a beginning farmer and I'm curious if Lindsay or Abby or uh, David remember, and Tyler remember where they found out about these programs and which ones might apply to their farms. And like, do, and if you continue to look in a certain place to, to get this information. Hey, Lindsay here. Um, we knew about them because other farms we'd worked for had used them in other states. Um, but also when we moved, when we bought our farm, you know, a big selling point was all the equip infrastructure that had already, you know, been in there. So we were lucky like that. But to stay updated, um, I feel like about once every two years, I kind of like panic and call Joe at NRCS office. And I'm like, what else could we be doing? Or are we behind on things? And so we rely pretty heavily on FSA and NRCS. Luckily in Athens, they're in the same office, which is nice, or same building, um, and just check in and, and kind of update on what we're doing, you know, and what we plan to do as that changes and um, see if they've got anything coming up or anything we missed. It's Abby. Um, I, I really relied on OPA's list of resources during pandemic to find what was available to farmers. So that was a good one. Um, Michael Fields Institute put, used to put out a really nice list of grant opportunities available. And if you go to the USDA page uh, and AMS, they you can sign up to get updates when they release uh, grant opportunities and updates to the grant opportunities. So um, that's a helpful way. David Bright here. Um, I guess I would share that my dad sort of brought me up knowing uh, where to go and what to do. Um, Clinton County did a pretty proactive effort to, to communicate through newspapers at that time, it's hard to believe. Um, but that was the social media uh, used at that time. And uh, I think all the counties do a pretty darn good job, uh, including Athens County, where I live, of uh, circulating information about what's available to you in terms of workshops, 
and a uh, heads up on any movement of, of insects that might be threatening a crop in your region. Uh, so um, that's how it came about for me anyway. Why don't we have Tia be, excuse me, um, the last question, unless something else comes up, you know, quickly right after. So Tia, go ahead. I'm sorry, August, I forgot to lower my hand, uh, but I do want to thank everybody that joined uh, on the panel and also the farmers that came to speak. Thank you so much. Hey, August, if I could real quick, just, uh, I, I pulled up the numbers here we have in the state of Ohio. Uh, on the loan side, because this is, we have what's called strategic goals. Uh, and one of those strategic goals um, focuses on percentage of loan volume going to targeted funds, uh, being beginning farmer, rancher, and SDA. Uh, so the, we have goals in Ohio this year for 48.6% of our targeted funds being uh, towards beginning farmer, rancher qualified folks uh, of, of all uh, distinction. And then 12.5% uh, of the funds going towards socially disadvantaged groups. And essentially, while while it doesn't, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't may, mean that those will be attained. Uh, what it does is it targets um, or it encourages uh, continued outreach to those groups to make sure that we are getting the word out and that we are getting uh, those type of applications in the door uh, and hopefully approved. Can I make just one more comment? I really appreciate you saying that, um, Kurt, because, uh, you know, like the gentleman that just spoke, he said that his father, he grew up kind of learning, he knew, you know, he had his father to tell him. And in a lot of minority communities, that's not the case. So I really appreciate that there will be outreach to those communities. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for following up on that. That was great. And really, thank you to everybody. This, I, I think the fact that we went a little bit over is just a testament to how much people were you know, interested and wanting to uh, engage further. We put a link to the evaluation in the chat. We would appreciate if you could just take truly one to two minutes to provide some feedback um, so we can know how to you know, do this better in the future. Um, or if there are any, is there anything that you know, didn't go well, we'd be able to address that with you too. So if you're able to go to the next slide, this is all of our contact information. Um, like I said, this will be, this is recorded. So you'll be able to view this again and take a longer look at everybody's contact information. And once again, there's a link to the evaluation and the QR code. Thank you, everybody. If there is nothing else, oh, let's see. Oh, they put a couple of the links into the chat for ease. So. Thank you again. This was wonderful. Um, I'm so glad that you all came and thank you to the uh, representatives from USDA and also the farmers uh, who so graciously shared a lot of information with us. And thank you to the participants for being so engaging. Um, you all are wonderful and I'm excited to hear about you know, how you might utilize some of these programs. So I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and we will make sure to uh, get the recording out to everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all.